Look, at the end of the day, being good corporate citizens is just the right thing to do. That being said, can we remain true to our core values, including operational sustainability, and continue to deliver meaningful returns for our stakeholders? I think we can. First, though, we need to make sure we don't too narrowly define our companies and paint ourselves into a corner. I don't think I've ever referred to my company, Frontiers North Adventures, as ecotourism. The reason why is it's my perception that the definition of that term varies depending on who you ask. We need to let our company's track records, actions, and roadmaps communicate our identity especially as it pertains to corporate social responsibility. Now, <clears throat> the experiences that we provide our guests hold tremendous value. Accordingly, we need to make sure our sales efforts are targeting the guests worth attracting, the guests <clears throat> that are going to help us earn the best possible return on our assets and investments. It needs to be our mission to target guests that value high quality and curated experiences. That's when we drive profitability. So once we've identified that our core values include doing right by our community and our environment, our actions need to reflect that. Now, in the travel industry, we're always needing to explore new destinations or rediscover familiar destinations in some new way. In doing that, a lot of the times, we're moving quicker than regulators. So <clears throat> over 30 years ago, my company ignited the polar bear tourism industry, brokering safe interactions between our guests and the world's largest land carnivore. It wasn't until much later <clears throat> that a national park sprung up to encompass the area we'd been operating for years. So whether our uncharted territories are a physical space, like the Canadian subarctic, or a virtual space, as is being charted by some of the companies here today, being a responsible corporate citizen puts us on the right path, and in a lot of cases, is a wise differentiator. So we need to make sure our corporate social responsibility efforts help us differentiate our companies from our competitors. We need to frame our desire to do right by our community and our environment, and we need to put that into a local context. So under pressure for, uh, by our competitors, and they were extremely popular for a number of years, I never engaged Frontiers North Adventures in carbon offsetting. The reason was, is it's my perception, or actually we had a really difficult time, tracing investments in carbon offset programs back to our neighborhood, so to speak. So instead of investing in carbon offsets, we dedicated our resources locally, and we created our own recycling program. We collected the recyclables that we generated in our subarctic operations and the recyclables of our partners in the community, and utilizing excess payload capacity in our flight charters, we transported those recyclables 1,000 kilometers south into an honest-to-goodness recycling program. We ran the program for five years, diverting a, a couple tons of recyclables from the local landfill, and were able to stop when the community of Churchill put in a recycling program better than ours. The point is that we need to make sure our investments in our corporate social responsibility have a positive impact at a local level, not in some far-off destination with which our stakeholders really have no association. And keep in mind that our stakeholders include our community. Look, we're travel companies, and those of us in the tourism sector are passionate about hosting guests at our destinations. <clears throat> we want to do right by our community and our environment, but maybe that's not our specialty. We need to make sure that we're focusing at, on what we do well and playing to our strengths. We need to do tourism, right? 
Align your companies with credible organizations that can help you accomplish your environment and social goals at a local level. The tough thing is, finding that right partner is pretty difficult. Our guests, that line is supposed to be there on purpose, by the way, our guests need to be able to intuitively connect our companies to the causes that we serve. At Frontiers North Adventures, it's our desire to share with our guests the wildlife of the North as well as the culture of the North. And in particular, we have a passion for helping conserve polar bears. Now, polar bears are a really important resource for the community of Churchill and the surrounding area. Way back in 2001, we partnered with an organization called Polar Bears International, whose mission it is to help conserve polar bears and polar bear habitat. So we've got the, the nonprofit organization uh, that's the, it's the leader in polar bear conservation in the whole wide world, and we've got the company that has the best access in the world to wild polar bears. It's a really good fit. Now, in terms of local relevant and positive impact, we can draw a straight line between the Polar Bears International programs that we support and a measurable difference in how people all over the world and at a local level better understand and appreciate polar bears. That blows my mind. Frontiers North is a tiny company. We operate on the frozen coastline of Hudson Bay in the Canadian subarctic. And by leveraging our passion and our expertise in a specific area, we're helping make a difference on a global scale. Now imagine the positive impact that larger companies can make by partnering with the right organization. Find that company, find that partner, they're out there, that so well complements your company, you'll be able to work together and make a positive change and leverage your efforts and take your service and your company to the next level. What really sucks, though, is that good corporate social responsibility is oftentimes not viewed as much more than good public relations. It's all the more reason we need our efforts in this area to be much more than skin deep. CSR needs to be baked into our DNA as part of the way that we do business. In my company, we have a, a CSR black box through which we run all of our decisions. So it doesn't matter if we're talking about our head office or our remote subarctic operations. We're always trying to make the decision that's best for our company, our community, and our environment. Now, it doesn't matter if you operate a small company with fewer resources, like I do, or if you work for a larger company that has its own VP of en environmental initiatives. We all need to empower our teams and our staff to make meaningful CSR-related decisions on a daily basis. Now, as a bit of an aside, the trick with helping conserve polar bears and polar bear habitat is, unlike a terrestrial problem to solve, you can't put a fence around multi-year pack ice in the Arctic. Once it's gone, it's gone for a long time. And why that's relevant is because polar bears rely on sea ice as a platform from which they hunt and eat and mate. The saying is, as goes the sea ice, so goes the polar bear. So as it turns out, the responsible corporate citizens that invest in a broad range of CSR initiatives, that empower their staff from the board of directors all the way down to make meaningful CSR-related decisions day in and day out, the companies with it baked into their DNA. These companies are shown to engage more meaningfully with all of their stakeholders, and these are the companies that are shown to perform better financially compared to the companies that don't invest in CSR at all. Now, what I really appreciate, knowing how hard it is to attract and retain good staff, is that meaningful CR, CSR results in a higher employee engagement. So morale is higher, business processes are tighter, a loyalty is right up there. It's this employee satisfaction that, for me, 
really enforces why we invest so heavily in CSR. Now, two major considerations we have. Uh, first and foremost, we all understand that for the majority of people out there, travel constitutes the largest part of their carbon footprint. And we're told that 97% of scientists agree that humans are causing our climate to change and that those changes are having a dramatic effect on how we do life. What we need to reconcile as a travel industry is that we're asking our guests to generate a ton of carbon dioxide and, and to be good customers and do that on a regular basis. So how do we deal with this? Taken at face value, travel in general seems to fly in the face of anybody really being a, a good steward. My take is that it's our responsibility. It's us, the people in this room, to engage our guests and to have them become more invested in their experiences with us. It needs to be our mission to send our guests home more engaged than when we receive them. So the cool part about this is two things. If we manage, at, if we manage to have our guests remain invested in our destinations, they return home and they continue to positively contribute to the environment and social fabric of our places. And these are the same guests that are going to help us uh, spread the word about our companies and our products and their personal networks, which are two huge wins. Broad, charitable, wholesome views of men and things cannot be acquired by sitting in one place all of one's lifetime. It needs to be noted here that our efforts in this space can never be about doom tourism. It's our responsibility to inspire our guests, not to scare or manipulate them into visiting our places. And most importantly, this isn't a problem for somebody else to solve. As leaders in the travel industry, it's our responsibility to develop better and more sustainable business models to take our industry into the future. Strong CSR track records, action plans, and roadmaps are going to help us get us there and keep us in the lead. Thank you very much. I look at the microphone. I want to ask one question. Thank you for that talk. That was amazing. Um, as you're looking at the ice that's melting where you are, um, what direct effect are you seeing when people go? Are they seeing less polar bears now? Is the season changing for you? Good question. So. Where we operate, uh, we're sort of at the center of the bullseye. So the bears on the west coast of Hudson Bay aggregate near the small town of Churchill every autumn waiting for the ice to freeze. And because we're at the center of the bullseye, we're seeing the same volumes of bears year after year. Anecdotally, though, what I can share is that the, uh, the biggest bears aren't as big as they used to be, right? And it's the bears on the fringes of that target that we know are... are uh, not doing as well. So their, their body weight is really low. Body weight is a really important uh, factor for bears to be able to get through a summer where they're not really eating much when they're forced on land and not able to access their food source. And to be able to get through long, tough winters, body weight is a, is a very important factor. So the other part is um, what we have noticed in the 30 years that our company has been operating is that we actually move our infrastructure throughout the course of our two-month season. We have a very short operating window. Which is, it's actually right now, October, November, every year. And in those two, in those, pardon me, in the last 30 years, we've seen our start and our finish, finish that two-month period, shift two weeks later in the year. So what that means is the ice on Hudson Bay is forming later resulting, and at the other end, it's melting earlier in the spring. So what this is resulting is a shorter period of time for those bears to be on the ice to hunt and eat seals and gain that, those valuable fat reserves. Thank you, John. Thank you.